Satnam, yogis and yoginis, hello, welcome back to one more video. Today we have something special. We're going to be talking about Kundalini. Kundalini, I think it's a, a word that just by hearing it is going to be exciting for the conversation we have ahead of us. Probably just the title of this video already was appealing to you if you clicked on it. So you may, know what, you may want to know more about what is the Kundalini. We're going to talk about the traditional meaning of what the word is, what does it mean, what is this energy, where is it, what does it do. But we're going to explore it also from a perspective of sound. What does the sound of the actual word Kundalini could mean? It's actually going to point to us very interestingly on what do we have to do with it and how to awaken it. And then we're going to go into mysticism and the mysteries. We'll find the meaning in the mysteries, a lot of symbolism and a lot of little stories from different areas of the planet and how they relate to snakes and the Kundalini. So we have a very exciting video ahead of us. I hope you stay till the end. Most people who come to our channel, uh, they leave in six or seven minutes. And I'm telling you, this is going to be a very interesting video, so I encourage you to stay till the end. It's going to be a good video with lots of drawings and um, finding actually how even the symbol of the dollar is related to the Kundalini. What? What are you talking about, Ardas? The dollar sign? Yes, indeed. We're going to see it. Uh, so uh, let's start with that. This is part one of, the, of, a, of a video on Kundalini. This part one is going to be about this, the myth and the meaning. And part two is going to be actually the process of awakening it and uh, the path that it takes. And, you know, what does it require for the Kundalini to awaken? And why should we awaken it? Where does it go? And all that. So more about the practice, the second video. I'm kind of doing this sometimes. You know, first video is like the theory and the myth philosophy. And the second is more about the practice. So let's go straight into that. I already... I talked about what Kundalini is in another video, but let me just review very quickly. Kundalini is an energy that is in the base of the spine and it's dormant, it's asleep, and uh, its uh, awakening is the awakening of our own consciousness. And there is some power in it, that's why we call it Kundalini Shakti. And as you awaken this energy, you awaken your own power. And that's very intrinsic to the practice of yoga. As you are doing yoga, uh, Kundalini is going to be stirred and that power is going to raise. So you do yoga, you're feeling more powerful and there's energy within you raising. And as you raise through the chakras, you're going to have an experience on that. The word Kundalini generally comes from Kundal, which means like a coiled, um, like a lock of hair from the person that you love like a, your beloved, so a call of her of the beloved. Uh, so that's a beautiful connection between Kundalini and love. There is something about love connected to that power, right? Power is a, a word that often has a double edge to it because we say, you know, power can corrupt. So we have to be scared of power. But actually, I don't think we should be scared of power. We should be uh, mindful not to be corrupted, but... Uh, power is something we need to take for ourselves, empower ourselves. Without power, we have no power to change our lives and to go towards our destiny and to fulfill what is the call of our soul, right? So we need power to do those things. And yes, power may corrupt, but don't be afraid of being corrupt. And so being afraid of taking our own power, rather be mindful and conscious of that so that we don't fall into that. So that's the meaning of the actual word, Kundalini. But um, if you have been seeing some of my videos, you know I'm, I'm kind of a specialized in sound. I love sound and I love meaning in sound. And I'm going to be based um, on the work that I did on another video, a set of videos on the mantra course, where I specifically go through each sound of the alphabet and the meaning that is conveyed into that in our own language, whether you speak English, Spanish, or French, German, or whatever language you speak, and Sanskrit, um, there is a meaning link to that, those sounds. And we humans intelligently create words which are uh, borrowing the meaning from the sound. And it's associated to the way we produce the sound. So let's go straight into that. So let's put this...
Kundalini, Shakti. Generally, we, we talk about it like this. Kundalini Shakti is the power of the Kundalini. So we can find here a number of sounds and the consonants are the ones that bring meaning to the word. So let's explore them. Sh, K, and T. K, N, D, L, N, S, H, K, and T. I will be brief because I have already gone into a lot of detail in my other, my mantra course. So I will just briefly address these sounds. And um, you can probably, uh, if you want to go deeper into that, you can go into searching these sounds in that course. So the K is the sound of uh, something closed, some container that is closed. It has a cover and it's closed and you need some sort of uh, key or clue to open it. And this key or clue, only some people have access to it. Maybe the kings and the queens or those who belong to, to, belong to the clan or the coven or they are the club or the secret or the upper echelon of the society or who has access to the secret. The secret knowledge, yeah? This secret. There is all these K sounds. And, you know, we do Raja Yoga, yoga, the yoga of kings. So it's interesting that's the, the ones who are, this yoga is giving you the key and the clue to open this container. Now, because we have a container uh, with a cover, this is representative for the fifth and the first chakra, which is, you know, the first chakra linked to the second, which is an emptiness there literally for women with a womb and the mouth is another emptiness so first and fifth chakra are connected here the n sound it's a narrow sound and small so we have words like scrunch or cinch or pinch or a notch or a note or a niche nook my nose is a small so all this is pointing to a point. The letter D is, implies down. And there is some sort of flow going down. And it's uh, words like dark, depressed, subdued, dent, something dull. These many, many words which start with D, there is some sort of going down in them. And uh, interesting, N and D together, we have words like sound, the word sound, which, you know, we have to access our throats and make, it, make them narrow, press, and then something goes down in a way to get pressure to get the voice to come out. So sound, sound, it's already, um, to make the word sound, we are calling upon the qualities of the N and the D. If we go to the letter L, it's interesting because Lam is the first chakra, uh, the Bija sound for the first chakra. So the L sound can be induced to move. We're talking about the first chakra, but if we, it's not going to be forceful like the letter like the letter R. The letter L, when it does move, is more like like a flow, like a glow, like a blow, more like that kind of movement. And it's, that's when the L comes with a vowel, generally. Not by itself, but with a vowel. Now, another thing that the L contains is some relationship to gravity. Or anti-gravity. So some words from the L are going to be heavy, like the law. And some are going to be light, like light or love. So there's something about gravity, which is, you know, relationship to earth. And that's the first chakra as well. So we are all within the first chakra now. And the letter N, again, we're going to go referring to one point. That's interesting. Now, if we take Kundalini, the symbol of the Kundalini is a snake. And we can find the, that the S sound, 
is the sound that is more connected to the snake. And we find a lot of words which have this S or start with S that relate to the sound to the snake in some way. Snakes or serpents, they are slim and they have a smooth and silky body and skin and uh, soft and they are asleep and still and slumber for a while in a circle until someday suddenly they wake up and they slither up, they hiss and, uh, and go up and strike. Anyway, there are so many words with the letter S, we could be doing s sounds with the S for a long while. But it, when, some of the things that are interesting are actually very spiritual. Spiritual. There's a spirit, there is soul, the self, the swami, the saint, the sadhu, the sacred, the sadhu, <laughs> the sage. <laughs> There's so many words with the letter S. So S is the intimately the sound of the snake of the Kundalini. Interesting then, then if we are talking about the S, that the next word, Shakti, it's actually start with SH. Phonetic symbol for SH is like this, a capital S. And that is like an eggshell. The sounds of S can easily break. So we have words like crush or smash or mash or bash or squash dash, they are breaking sounds, sounds that are going to break the shell. Now the K again refers to this secretness and something finding the key in a way. And uh, so that would be the key. And the T implies movement with an objective. The T sound doesn't tell us which direction is the movement. Uh, but you can find that they are always directed towards a certain goal, the T sound. So traveling is not meandering, it's traveling in a trek, going on a trip to a certain place, right? And we need transport to get there, right? It's, there is a track to get there. There's a stream of cars going there. There's a street which is going to take us there. So there is, there is always some sort of objective. Now, by itself, Kundalini Shakti, the sounds don't tell us which is the direction. But look, if we are talking about there is some sort of egg in the first chakra, and uh, you know, in the first chakra we have a symbol. This is worth drawing it. All chakras are drawn like uh, like lotus flowers. The first one has four petals. I could have done it much bigger. Okay, never mind. There is some Shivalingam and there is a snake, very little snake, <laughs> uh, three times and a half coiled around. So imagine that there is in this shell, there is a Shivalingam and the snake here, three and a half times coiled. And if you find the key, the shell can break and the snake is going to Uncoil, let me put it in pink. And it's gonna go up. Because it's not gonna go down. This is the first chakra, right? So, so we're gonna go up the spine. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about this in the next video. Yeah, the next video is about the practice and what happens with the Kundalini through the practice. And so we're gonna see how this is moving. But already, just by looking at the sounds, it's very revealing, it's very interesting. Now, if we think about breaking, that would be the key. What is the thing that in yoga more, you know, some of the things that are most associated with the sh sound? And we have shunya. The word shunya implies zero, which is generally associated to silence. So as we are chanting mantras, like lam, yeah? We are creating a space of silence within us. And when you enter into the silence and the zero happens, we zero our ego. And then in that zero state, that's Shunya. 
Now, when you are capable of holding that state in a balance between Shakti and Bhakti and Pingala and Yin and Yang, we will talk more about this in, in, a, in a while. In the balance between the two, in the Shunya, what awakens is the Shushumna. So here we would have that the, the, the central channel is being awakened. And we have the double sh sound here, awakening the central channel. Sh, incidentally, is a sound that helps to put babies to sleep. It's said, it's like white nose. They said, what white noise? <laughs> Not nose, noise. It said that uh, babies hear that sound in the belly of the mother, like the blood flow. Maybe when they are in the amniotic fluid, babies hear shh. So when you do shh, this sound for babies, it calms them down and helps them to go to sleep, which is probably why from there comes our shh when we make children shh this sound to put them to shush them, to shush them, to make silence. Interesting the the symbol of a circle of the mouth with one line in between. We will see this symbol in a little while. I just realized this. A very interesting connection. So there's the Kundalini, right? And there's the zero and the shell yeah, of the egg. Shh. Very revealing. All right. Well, this is for sound. This is about sound. But let's go now. Let's talk a little bit about mysticism, mysticism symbolism, and the mysteries and the meaning behind the mysteries in mysticism. Because the symbol of the snake is a very common one in many traditions, in many cultures. And first of all, I would like to mention that if we go very far back, we have the Australians, Aboriginal people, they have a story of a rainbow serpent, which is, as it moves, it creates the world. And so with the turns, it's creating a mountain here, a river here, right? And it's moving. It's like a rainbow one. Rainbow is, the, the, the colors of the rainbow are symbolic, but also the fact that a, a rainbow up here is symbolic. Because rainbow requires light and water. The water element is happening here, and, uh, and it's creative. It, it implies creativity and fertility. And light is also very interesting, the concept of light. We're going to see light again and again through the symbols. But also the water and the fertility. So that's, you know, 6,000 years before Christ, we already have this symbol of the snake in these very ancient cultures, and connecting it uh, to this fertility. And not only, you know, even in, in other cultures, um, like in Africa and America and India, I believe there is the symbol of the rainbow coming up as well again and again in relationship to fertility and rain and therefore also to sex. So one of the things that the snake has is that uh, it changes its skin. And the changing of the skin of the snake is something that implies some transformation, but also some immortality in some way like you know this is my old self and now this self is dying and a new self is born and like a new skin with a new snake comes out so healing and immortality also are very connected to the I, the symbol of the snake and many mythologies so let's see uh, in some of the symbolism and some of the symbols in the um, Ancient Greece, there is the symbol of Auroboros, the snake, which is eating its own tail. And it, it represents eternity. It represents, you know, it's eating itself, so destruction, but also creation. Interesting uh, of the circle again, going back to the circle, we find the circle here. So something cyclic, something circular something very interesting as here as well. So this is Ouroboros, yeah? Greeks and Egyptians. Another, another symbol which could be interesting, it comes from uh, Norse mythology, and we have 
this kind of snake you'll see. Let's see if I can do it properly, like that. Norse mythology, again the snake. This is called Jormungand. Jormungand. And it's said that this snake was encircling the world. And, um, and there is a whole battle between Thor and, and Jormungand because uh, Thor is trying to get it out because he's, he's damaging the earth and he's not letting people live. Well, there's many mythologies, many stories like that. Let's carry on. Let's do a few more. Uh, a very, very similar to Jormungand, we have an Egyptian symbol which starts like this and starts to grow. Here we have the snake again. And this is called a pep. I think you can find it in the tomb of, of Ramses. And this is a deity that lives in the darkness. A pep that lives in darkness, in chaos. And it's um, very interesting because a pep is born from Ra. I believe, as far as I read, I've been researching in Wikipedia and some other sources in the internet, and it's born from the umbilical cord of Ra. And, you know, that's interesting because Ra is the light. Now, Pep lives in the darkness, but Ra is the light. And there's two kinds of light, even in us. We say how there is a light that, makes, that is the fire produces, and there is the light that the sun produces. And this, the fire light is the light of the third chakra. That's where we have the fire energy. And the, the light of, of, the, of the sun is like the light of God. It's like the light of the heavens, which is represented by... You can see it in the arc, li arc line in, around the head of the, of the saints. You can see some circular light, but you can also see it bigger like the sun above us and our radiant body, yeah? Making 10, this is the 10 spiritual body, so it's the symbol of the number 10, there's the zero above us. So in this case, Ra, uh, the god Ra, they, from the umbilical cord comes this snake. Interesting also the symbol of number eight here appearing, yeah? Infinite, relating to infinite, which, you know, if the snake and changing the skin relates to immortality, now we have somebody who lives infinitely, yeah? So we have this connection. And, and an interesting thing is that the, if Apep is the deity of darkness, the opposite would be the deity of light or truth. And that's called Mat. In, I mean, we're talking Egyptian mythology now. And Matt is the one who is regulating the stars and the cosmic balance, so it holds the truth. Now, some, something very interesting is that if Matt is truth, there is another word which uh, we have is mathematics. Mat, mat, mathematics, mat, mat. I was looking at the etymology of the word. Mathematics comes from mathema, a, a Greek word. Uh, something implying wisdom or knowledge, but it doesn't make any reference to Egyptian math. But in, I think there has to be a connection. Mathematics is math and math. And look, the Greek uh, culture and the Egyptian culture were so close to each other. And there is kind of like a succession of, you know, the mysticism from the, the Egyptians in becoming, you know, rationalism and, and philosophy from the Greeks later on, but they are just across the channel, just across the sea. So there, there was a lot of exchange of ideas and culture and spirituality, of course, is a very important one. So I would say the goddess of truth being represented as math and mathematics, which is something that we very much associate with truth, there has to have some meaning, you know, is the true of the true, of the, tr the true of the truth, you know, and the, the essence of the essence, mat mat, you know, the, what is true in the truth or going truer than the truth, you know, what's the truest thing of the truth, which is something very relevant in a moment, 
in our culture where we question what is true. There's so many ideas of what we believe is true. And those are our beliefs, our opinions, but opinions change. Opinions are um, changing with the times and with the cultures. Um, what is truly unchanging? What is tr something that truly doesn't change and that we can associate with truth? Well, mathematical formulas are perfect by themselves. Two plus two equals four. And that's mathematical. That's true as it is. And um, that's why the language of mathematics can represent nature, physics, earth. We can, we can apply it to explain many things in a way that is irrefutable. If you follow the equation, that's irrefutable. There can be many theories of how the universe works, but the, the mathematics, they are perfect by, by the way they are. So very interesting, the numbers, mathematics, are associated to the light, and they are in the opposite spectrum to the, this ap apep or apep, uh, this snake living in the in the darkness. I think there is something interesting here. But okay, let's let's move on. Let's carry on. There is more mythologies which talk about the the um, the snake. Obviously, we are talking about mathematics coming from Mathima. Mathima being wanting to find knowledge. We will find obviously the myth uh, or the story of uh, the Christian story of the Garden of Eden. And the snake, which, you know, the snake can have the sim can be symbolized as something good or something evil. We have seen a lot of um, good symbolism, but there is also like the evil or dark symbolism, like in Apep, it lives in the darkness. So in the case of the Garden of Eden, the snake is the shape that takes Satan to uh, seduce the female into wanting to find wisdom and knowledge and eating the forbidden fruit. So I think partly why the snake is associated to something evil is because the snakes are poisonous and so they are dangerous, right? So that that's probably why it's a symbol that is often used to connect to something evil as well. But in any case, it's interesting that the symbol and Christianity is also... We will see this. We will see something else um, related to Christianity. But let's go back. More stories of snakes. We have the uh, Quetzalcoatl. That's the the feathered serpent of the Toltec and Aztec mythology. And um, what else? We have Native Americans, the Hopi people. They have an annual dance of the snake youth. And the snake girl. Snake youth is a sky spirit and snake girl is the spirit of the underworld. This is, we're talking Hopi, North America. And look, the underworld, this is the realm of Apep. Yeah, this is where the, the goddess of darkness lives. So how interesting that the very same symbol appears for both. And this relationship of this dance between the Hopi people, between the dance of the snake girl, a girl with the shape of a snake as well, and that's the underworld spirit, dances and meets with the sky spirit. I think this is very symbolic for the meeting between Kundalini in the first chakra, snake girl, because Kundalini is female, that's Shakti, it's not Shiva, and racing up to the crown, we will see, this will go to the crown, we will see this in next video. I'm not drawing a yogi today. I'm just drawing from the first to the last, the seventh chakra. And interesting that the crown k -k, is given to the kings. K -k, remember? Those who are belonging to the clan or the coven who have the secret key for, to open the cover. So that's what has to happen. Yeah, that to open the wisdom, to open the light, to find enlightenment, the light is in the heavens, the light is up here, the darkness is down here. Which we often associate to something bad or evil, but darkness doesn't have to be in evil. This is part of us. This is like yin and yang, we have to relate to it in some way. But sim the symbology is very interesting. Yeah, So the Hopi people would dance and relate the, the, the girl, 
the uh, underworld spirit of the snake girl dancing with the sky spirit. How interesting. And they, they actually draw a little mandala with sand on the with sand. And um, I've seen some drawings and it has four sides, four snakes with four colors. And, you know, the first chakra has these four petals. And I think there's a nice connection. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. Maybe. But um, there's something. Okay. Those are the Hopi people. Uh, let's, let's go on. We find um, another one. Where do I have this? Oh, yes, I forgot to mention. Matt is like a woman figure, but she is holding a symbol, which is in the hand. She's holding an ankh. I'm sure you are all familiar with this symbol. It represents immortality. Uh, well, it represents life, actually. Uh, but also, um, sometimes this hunk, you can see it with a snake. This would be the body of a snake. And so you can have here again. Yeah. So this is a snake around a pole. And the body of the snake is the one that makes the curve. The snake represents the uh, rebirth and the ankh represents life. So Matt holds Ankh with a snake and is the opposite or the other side of Apep. Very interesting. Infinite and the infinite here. Well, I was talking about Christianity. I said I will say something else about Christianity. Let me just point out how interesting that in Christianity they use this symbol of the cross. Crucifixion of Jesus, and very often it is drawn with a circle. You will find it in many churches, this cross with this circle. It can mean a number of things, this circle. It can also be like the, again, like the saints have this circle around the head. And so Jesus' head, which is falling as he is crucified, there we can have the circle. But it can also represent the sun. The sun. Circle is the, is the image of the sun, the light. And you know, Jesus was the son of God, and God is like a sun, is like light. And traditionally, before Christian religion, uh, we used to uh, pray to the sun that come and blesses us with their light so that the crops can grow. So the symbol of the sun as God is very significant. It's all symbolism, symbolisms. Let's go on. We have... Greeks have a Asclepius. It's a Greek god which carried another symbol which has snakes. And you can find there is actually two snakes facing each other. Like that. That would be one. The other one would be this. This is called the Caduceus. I'm probably not pronouncing it very well. This is the way, the Spanish way to pronounce it. And uh, it often has some wings as well here. We will find it. Something like that. And these wings are also, I, 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 not all the drawings of the Caduceus have the wings, but you can see the circle here. So that's interesting that some of them would contain the circle. And Caduceus is the symbol for healing. So this is the god of medicine, yeah. Asclepius. And the most interesting thing about this symbol is that the two snakes are intertwisting each other, intertwining each other, and they are represent they are very, very similar to Apep. If you remember also Jormungand, yeah, coming from the uh, Apep coming from the umbilical cord of Ra. 
And this looks like an umbilical cord. And it lacks, looks like a DNA as well. So very symbolic, actually. And um, what, it's talk, what it's reflecting about, what this is symbolizing, this is the meeting of the two energies within us. So in yoga, we know we have Ida and Pingala, which is the female and the male, and represent the bhakti, the devotion, and the shakti, the power. And both of them are twisting around each other. And we need to find a balance between these two forces within us. You can find it many other expressions, Shiva Shakti, Purusha Prakriti. You'll find this polarity of things in Yang, which we need to find the middle path, you know, like the Buddhist says. Which, by the way, I think there was a study of Buddha and there is a, there is a snake. Muchalinda, Mukalinda, Muchalinda, something like that. There was, I, I remember now, there was a, a snake which protected Buddha from, um, from a storm. I think. And I, and I remember now there's another story of a Guru Nanak being a child and laying down, having a nap. And, and there is this, um, uh, somebody from the town passed by with a horse and they see he's sleeping, he's having a nap, and there's this cobra with the hood open about to strike. So he got, oh my God, he's going to strike the baby, the child. And then when they got close, it wasn't actually going to strike. It was protecting Nanak with the hood. It was covering the sun, so it was moving with the with the with the sun to 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 cover so that the nanak had shadow in the face so he could sleep. I think that's a, another beautiful story. But again, snakes protecting Buddha, protecting um, Buddha, um, Guru Nanak, and this snake that goes over Shiva. I think it's very symbolic. It could be symbolic. All these that we are talking about today is quite symbolic, but it could also be quite explicit like one of a, a friend of mine a teacher a yogi teacher yogini a friend of mine she said that she had some sort of experience of kundalini arising and and as it rose through the back she heard the rushing of the of the kundalini and she could feel it exactly like in some drawings where you can see shiva with a snake on top with the hood open a cobra so she said it was exactly like that. The feeling was just like a snake, like a cobra on top of the head. So very interesting. But um, yeah, let's go to the umbilical cord. So when you balance both energies, yin and yang, Ida and pingala, that's when shushumna opens. Remember shushumna, yeah? That's the path where the kundalini has to rise. So this symbol is very special. It has the zero, like the ankh. It has the polarity and the balance between the two. And um, I think it's relevant now. It's, I'm going to mention the thing about the money. Yeah. And something else. OMS. The, oh. Um, uh, in Spanish. Organización Mundial de la Salud. That's the World Health organization, WHO. Yeah, I was thinking like, this doesn't sound right in English. But the symbol is kind of like this. So we have the circle again, it's being implied here. And there is generally a drawing of the planet as well in the circle in between. And then there is one vertical line. But now we lost one of the snakes. And we have, we only have one of the snakes. How sad that we lost one of the polarities. Now we have the Shakti, but we don't have the Bhakti. So I think it's very revealing. I'm not going to say more about that. I'm just going to point out that if you look at the center of this, this is the symbol of the dollar. Again, one of the snakes around a vertical axis. So are we interested about the dollars or are we interested about health? Do we want the immortality or do we want the power in the world through dollars? Very interesting 
symbology, symbology there. We can see another symbol connected to this, uh, the Sikh Kanda. There is a central sword, and then there is two curved swords that would be Midi and Pidi, but actually they represent Ida and Pingala as well. Midi and Pidi, which would be representing also Shiva and Shakti. And uh, there is a circle as well. So you can see the parallelism, the symbolism, how it's being repeated again and again. Fascinating, we could carry on, but I think it's already getting long. Let me let me go to a few thing a few more things. One is the the, the Sanskrit alphabet, which this word comes from. Yeah, it comes from Sanskrit. Sanskrit is written as the Vana Deva Nagiri. The alphabet is the Devanagiri. Devanagari, sorry, Devanagari. And um, that's the in the letters of the Sanskrit alphabet, how they are codified. And Devanagari is like, Deva is divine. So it's like a Nagari could be like people, you know, so, and, so this could be a communication for the people. But there is another way to see this, which is Naga. Naga it's a snake people in, in the Hindu, Hindu tradition. The Nagas were uh, generally some sort of um, deity which has some human body and, and sorry, snake body and human head. And they were like kind of half divine. They weren't really deities. They were half divine people. And um, they used to live in the underworld as well. So how interesting we connect again to the underworld and um, even the very word of, the very words in sanskrit are connected to this could it be that sanskrit is the language that is designed to wake up the kundalini the naga in us which is what is going to wake up from the underworld to go to the higher world and to awaken our consciousness and to find the light could it be I just want to bring one more one more story. And I'm going to have to read something from the computer for this story. This is in uh, China. Nugua. It's a woman headed snake, snake with the head of a woman, which is a goddess, a very famous goddess in Chinese stories, Chinese mythology, and she um, creates mankind. So that's a very relevant goddess to talk about. She is the responsible one for creating mankind. And she um, has some a very special task in history. So I'm going to read a little comment. You can find this in Wikipedia <clears throat> uh, about Nugwa or Nuwa. I think it's pronounced Nugwa, but it's written Wa with W. And uh, we can find, let's, let's hear what the Wikipedia says about this serpent goddess, serpent body, human head. It says, going back to more ancient times, the four pillars of heaven were broken. So earth was like um, below and heaven above, and there's four pillars holding heaven. And the nine provinces, these are the nine provinces of China, were in tatters. Heaven did not completely cover the earth. <coughs> so um, fires blessed out of control and could not be extinguished and water flooded in great expanses and would not recede. So fire and water. These are the two elements that are generally out of balance. Fire and water. Fire represents the karma, the fire of karma. And water is the sadness of the tears of our drama. So in our life, we get caught up between the drama and the karma. And in the drama, we generate more karma and the karma comes back as more drama. So fire and water are out of balance. I'm doing my own interpretation, as you will notice, of this text. But I find it quite revealing. Ferocious animals ate blameless people. Look, the animal nature in us took over, right, over the human nature. 
predatory birds snatched the elderly and the weak. Thereupon, Nugwa smelted together five colored stones in order to patch up the azure sky. Five colored stones representing the five blue, uh, the five uh, tatvas. In yoga, we would say earth, water, fire, air, and ether. They would say fire, metal, and, and, uh, and wood. But it's fire elements, fire stones smelted together. So finding the, the five together, the five um, tatvas to patch up the azure sky. Now that's also interesting because it's talking about the sky. The, the sky is up here and we talk in yoga and when the Kundalini reaches the crown, we, can, we get enlightened and we are touching the ethers. And we know that after death, if we are fortunate enough and graced, we can reach these five blue ethers color azure. And it's five, like the five stones. She then cut off the legs of a great turtle to set them up as the four pillars. I'm not very sure about the turtle. What does it mean? I think there is various stories, even in Chinese mythology as well, like worlds upon, upon, on top of turtles. And I think there's some, some, uh, some books as well by Terry Pratchett talking about like a great turtle and the world on top, something like that. But I'm not sure what, what it meant by to cut off the legs of the turtle. I don't know what it represents here. If you do know, please write in the comments. If you have an idea of this or, or, um, or a different interpretation of what I said, please write in the comments. So she cut off the great turtle's legs and put them as the four, pil the, the four pillars, which by the way, after this mythology, after this myth, this story, the pillars become very, very predominant in uh, Chinese architecture. You can see it in many temples and the architecture of that time. She then killed the black dragon to provide relief for the Ji province. Now, this is another thing charged with symbolism. The black dragon. Dragon, by the way, dragons are kind of snakes and they are like the they are very often in, in many myths. As I was researching for snake myths, and many dragon myths came up as well. And they are another form of snakes. And so she killed the, drag, the black one, the black dragon. Could it mean the darkness in us? Yeah? And the ego. The ego is like a dragon, right? To be slain. And she says, kill the black dragon to provide relief for the Ji province. Now, the Ji province of the nine provinces of China is the one in the highest point. So on the north of the Yellow uh, river, yeah, on the highest point. So that's very symbolic. We are killing the ego, which is right here, and to get to the highest point. So we're getting to reach the crown. And piled up reeds and cinders to stop the surging waters, and the azure sky was patched. The four pillars were set up, the surging waters were drained, the province of G was tranquil. G is the highest point, so a tranquil mind. Crafty vermin died off. So we dealt with the animal nature and the people, the blameless people, were preserved their life. Their life were, were preserved. I think it's full of symbolism. The stones, the five stones, the sure sky, the ethers, so the, the black dragon. There's so many elements in this little story. I wish I knew more and I wish I knew more Chinese stories. I love Chinese uh, culture. So... That would be very interesting to know more about. If you do know about this Nu Gua, if you know more stories, please tell us in the comments. I want to learn more. And this is the way we can learn from each other. So do this. If you reach up until here, I, I thank you very much from my heart that you, are, um, you reached the end of the video. It doesn't take anything to hit the like. It's free to subscribe to the channel and you help us uh, grow and reach more people. I hope you enjoy this first part on the Kundalini and the next part is going to be about some of the practices that are required to accomplish what has to be accomplished with regards to the Kundalini. And maybe we can talk about the dangers as well. So we will do that in next video. Until next time, thank you very much. Sadnam.